All right. All right. Welcome everybody to our cat behavior workshop with Molly DeVos. Today we're going to be focusing on destruction issues, which is definitely something that we see our fosters and adopters and cat owners in the community needing help with. Um, many of you are not with DPA, which is amazing. And I wanted to welcome you guys and tell you a little bit more about us. My name is Janae Bennett, and I am the Dallas Pets Alive Foster Director. We were founded 10 years ago in 2012, and we're located here in DSW. Um, if you are not from uh, North Texas or Dallas area, go ahead and comment where you're from. I'd love to see where everybody's watching from. <clears throat> I know Vivian's from Austria, so that's a shocker for lots of people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Jackie's from Ontario. I love, <laughs> I love it. Welcome. So we focus our efforts mostly on North Texas shelters such as Dallas Animal Services, um, Mesquite, Irving, Garland, Waxahachie. And um, we started out with mainly dog fosters. And then in 2015, somebody convinced somebody to bring in a litter of kittens and since then, we have um, actually had more cat fosters in 2020 and 2021 than we did in previous years. So we're growing and that's why we started these behavior workshops with Molly. And we are so excited that you're here and Molly's going to take it away. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Looks like uh, people from all around the globe today. That's awesome. That's awesome. I am going to go ahead and share my screen with you. There we go. And we'll get started. Let me put all of us. Whoop, you want to admit for us, Janae? Well, Got him. All right. Okay, I'm gonna put this over here. Okay, so let me get back up here. Hold on. Destruction issues. Does that sofa look familiar to some of you? <laughs> I'm gonna go through today's um, seminar pretty quickly on these problems so that, um, I leave time at the end for us to talk about some issues that you guys might be having specifically at home. So, um, so we'll, we'll get started here. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Molly DeVos and I'm a certified feline training and behavior specialist. I also have a nonprofit called Cat Behavior Solutions. And in that nonprofit, I take cases in the home, which kind of makes me a cat shrink, and uh, to detect what behavior issues might be going on in your home and to help modify those behaviors. I also um, spend, spend a lot of time working in shelters themselves so that we can help the cats that have found themselves in a shelter, unfortunately in a shelter, um, and maybe not be behaving well in a shelter setting. So I do a lot of work in shelters and I also have a weekly podcast called Cat Talk Radio. And on Cat Talk Radio, you'll find lots of information about behavior and caring for your cat and things of that nature. So if you haven't checked that out, be sure to check that out as well. So today we're gonna to talk about, we'll start off with why, why do cats destroy things just kind of in general? And what can we do about it? And then we'll go into some specific behaviors because they're all a little bit different. Um, clawing, eating plants, chewing cords, and trash rummaging are the ones, and pica are the ones that I picked to cover today. And then if you have any others, um, we'll have some time left over at the end and we'll, uh, we'll go into those at the end. 
Okay, so let's start off with why did they destroy things? The first reason is because they're idle. They don't have enough exercise. They're simply just laying around being bored, right? They don't have enough activity. Cats don't need a lot of exercise like dogs. You know, dogs, you got to take out and walk and they need a lot of exercise. Cats don't really need a lot of exercise, but they need some activity and they need mental challenges. Without a mental challenge, you know how they say idle hands are the devil's playthings? Well, kind of same way with cats. Idle minds, they get very, very bored. Also curiosity, which is a natural cat behavior, right? Who doesn't have a cat that's curious about things? And that gets them into trouble a lot of times. I know it does get Pico into trouble all the time. My cat's Pico de Gato. And... Uh, he does get in trouble, <laughs> attention seeking. So things get ruined to get the attention of the owner. So what does that look like? Cat claws the sofa and you go, oh my God, stop, stop doing that. And presto, the cat's gotten your attention. And we're all guilty of it because we don't want our things destroyed and we don't want the cats getting hurt. So if they're doing things like chewing cords, you feel compelled to go talk to them and try to get them to stop. Sometimes we even pick them up. And once the cat realizes that that behavior gets our attention, negative or positive, then they're very likely to do it again. Obsessive compulsive behavior. So there really isn't any known cause or cure for obsessive compulsive behavior. Um, some think that it's pain relieving, right? So if, if they do certain things, it might be relieving pain or it's pleasure inducing, like releasing chemicals in the brain that make the cat feel good. And, and some of these obsessive compulsive behaviors may even be a coping mechanism for a cat that's in a very stressful situation or a cat with anxiety. Those are the main reasons why cats do these behaviors. So what can we do about it? Again, this is kind of in general, and um, we'll go into some more specifics about those specific behaviors in a minute. But the first thing you can do is don't reinforce it. So don't go over there and pick up the cat and go, I've told you a thousand times, don't claw the sofa, because they're going to go, wow, that worked. I'm going to go do it again. Look, she picked me up. Don't punish the cat, all right? Cats don't respond well to punishment because they don't see any link between the punishment and the crime, all right? Punishment only teaches your cat to fear you. And worse, it may lead to aggression. So be very careful. Yelling, squirting with the water gun, or startling the cat with loud noises when he scratches teaches him that your presence, rather than the act of scratching, brings punishment. If your cat is punished for scratching only when you're there, then he's simply going to do all the scratching when you leave the house. So it just doesn't work and it erodes the bond you have with your cat. So don't try to punish your cat for the behavior. Do use deterrence that are not associated with you. So again, a, a squirt gun or a water bottle, that's associated with you. Yelling is associated with you. So there are things um, like this is a, they call a scat can and it's a motion detective can. And it's just a little, like an air can, like the stuff you clean off your computer keyboard with. And so you put it in front of the place where the cat is doing the bad thing. And when the cat walks by or coming up to that place, then this goes tsst and, and scares them away. And you have, then you can just say, oh my gosh, what happened, right? <laughs> like as if you know nothing. <laughs> Show the cat what you want it to do instead, right? So I always say you can't tell a cat no. 
You have to show it what you want it to do instead, which means this, not that. Okay. And we'll talk about some specifics of what those things are that you can point your cat to with those specific behaviors. So let's jump into clawing furniture and carpet, right? Why, why do they do this behavior? Well, first of all, why they don't do it. They are really not on a mission to destroy your home. Your home is their home and that's not why they're doing it. They're satisfying natural needs, right? And we'll talk about what those are now because it's a marking behavior. So just like the cats that are spraying the perimeters of your house to mark that as their territory, they're doing the same thing when they're clawing in two ways. There is, first of all, a scent gland in between their toes and on their paws. And so when they scratch, then it, it leaves that scent where they've scratched and it says, this is mine. Now I will tell you that in multi-cat households, scratching occurs like 85% more frequently than in an only cat household. I have very soft butter leather couches that you can see behind me. And if I showed you the front of the arms, <laughs> you would see that one time I never, had, I never had a scratching problem at all with my cat, Tabasco, but I was fostering a cat and that cat came over and decided he'd scratch the front of my leather sofas. Well, then Tabasco started because now that cat's scent is deposited there. And then my cat had to deposit his scent on top of it. It's an effort for them to create a community scent. So in a multi-cat household, it happens a lot more frequently. It's also a visual territory marker. So in addition to leaving smell, they leave lines or as you see in this picture, ripped up pieces that visualizes to other cats that this is my territory. In the wild, when they're clawing on trees and like you've seen the big cats claw on trees leaving big, huge marks, those are visual territory markers that identify this is my territory. So it is a very natural thing for them to do. It also removes that little translucent covering or sheath from the claws, right? So there is some theory that those little nail sheaths that are left behind at the scene of the crime are an additional visual marker for potential territory invaders that says, you know, this is my territory. And again, like I said, it builds a community scent. So it's another way for a cat to place his scent and then the other cats in the household to come along and place their scents on top of it. So how do we stop it? Big question. First of all, you need to neutralize the odors on your sofa where they are scratching, okay? Because it's a scent marking component, they are far more likely to re-scratch the areas that already have their scent on it. So to break that cycle, you've got to use an odor neutralizer to deodorize these areas. So that's step one. Step two is to give them an alternative, right? Remember this, not that, all right? So you've got to give them an object like a scratching post or a scratching mat like this cat scratching on to say, if I don't want you to scratch my furniture, then I've got to give you something that's acceptable to both of us to scratch on. So you've got to identify their scratching preferences. Now, this is a, a several different components. Texture is very, very, very important. Some cats, you know, you'll notice, well, location can be particularly of interest. So if they're, for instance, on these sofas behind me, I have windows all along this side of the room. If the scratching had occurred on the back of the sofa 
towards the window, the cat might have been seeing another cat outside and be scratching there as a territorial marker to show that cat outside. Because it was on the front side, it was more of a territorial gesture for the other cats in the household. So look at texture. If your cat is not scratching the scratching post, but it is scratching your leather sofa, go to the fabric store and try to get some leather material that is similar to your sofa and wrap it around that post and then put that next to your sofa. The other thing is orientation. Some cats like to scratch vertically, others like to scratch horizontally. Mine does both. He likes to scratch, so I have lots of choices. He has vertical choices and he has horizontal choices as well. So try to figure out what it is that your cat likes to scratch on. That's very, very, very important because they're picky little creatures. And then provide them similar surfaces. So here I'm showing you an example of, here's the backside of my soft leather sofa. So if I find a surface that is similar, this happens to be a, one of those really soft, like microfiber bath mats. And the backside of that bath mat's texture is very, very similar to the sofas because my sofas aren't real leather, by the way. <laughs> so there are probably some plastic material that they use on backing for, you know, tub mats. Anyway, that is kind of an example of what you'll need to do. The other thing you'll notice is that scratcher is very, very tall, right? So a cat needs to get a full back stretch. If I provided a little scratcher that's 12 or 18 inches tall, he's not gonna use it. My boy is real tall. So the scratchers need to be like 40 inches tall, really, really tall scratchers. So that's important. Same thing with the horizontal ones. Don't get those little dinky scratchers, get the biggest scratchers you can find and make them attractive. And what we said is texture is attractive, rub catnip on them, things like that. So then in addition to the this, I want you to do this, not that, we need to put deterrents on the areas that they're scratching, right? So make that target unacceptable or unattractive. So this particular stuff um, by Meluna is cool. It comes in these big sheets. You can cut them. Um, it's, it's very uh, adhesive and it'll stick to almost any surface. I, when I started having the trouble on my sofas with my foster cat, I got the double-sided tape. Well, the problem with this material that's leather but not leather is that when I put the double stick tape on there and then the foster cat was gone and I thought okay I'll pull it off well it pulled off the whole top layer of the of the color of that material so now not only do I have lots of scratch marks on the front of the arms but I have this nice wide strip of gray where the color's gone so I you know depending on your surface, be careful with the double stick tape. You might wanna try this stuff better. The other things that work are, um, I like carpet runners, you know, those plastic sheets that they sell at hardware stores and they're clear plastic and they have spikes on the bottom and they're meant to be put over carpets and stairs and runner areas and high traffic areas. Well, you can get that stuff and cut it out and then put it spikes out on your sofa. And if you have a, an upholstered sofa, you can get upholstery screws, which look like little corkscrews and screw that into the sofa so it can go around the corner or the back where they're scratching. And then it's kind of a sharp prickly material and that's not what they wanna scratch on. So a deterrent by itself isn't enough. You must provide the cat an alternative that they find attractive. So again, trying to decode what it is about that texture that the cat likes and whether that's a vertical or a horizontal place the cat is scratching is very important. And of course, you can trim their nails 
or put the little plastic covers on them. Now, trimming their nails and plastic covers isn't gonna stop them from wanting to scratch. That's a natural behavior. You're never gonna get your cat to stop scratching. You may get it to scratch at more acceptable items than your furniture or carpet, however, but the cat is going to scratch, it has to. They need it to stretch their back, they need it to keep their nails in shape. They need it to leave territorial scent markers, which are very important to cats. Cats are highly territorial. But you can put these little rubber caps on. I've done it for many friends and clients and, and my own cat when we were staying with a friend who had particularly nubby upholstered furniture that Pico just thought was awesome and uh, went to town on. So I ran out and got rubber caps and put them on Pico, which he hated, but they did last, um, sadly, actually, they last the full six weeks that they advertise them to, because um, I would have ideally loved to have been able to take them off him as soon as we uh, left the friend's house. So, eating plants. Why did they eat your plants? Well, boredom, right? If a cat's environment is not stimulating enough, they may eat plants or other things for entertainment, right? Curiosity. Sometimes the smell of a particular plant is curious to the cat and, and may want to make them just curious enough, like, wonder what that tastes like, because that, that smells interesting. Movement, you know, maybe you have a, a ceiling fan on or there's a breeze coming in and the leaves are moving and, and they're like, well, that looks like that might be fun to play with. And, and they go over and bite it. Um, so regurgitation. Cats often, as you've probably noticed, throw up after eating grass or plants. And that's because I could I could talk about why that's because for hours, but let's just let's just distill that down to they they lack an, an enzyme it's the amylase enzyme that they need to digest plant matter and starch and vegetable matter right so they really can't digest vegetable proteins and vegetable matter and they instinctively know that if they need to throw up to get rid of a hairball or something like that, that they can't digest feathers. They can't digest feathers. They can't digest fur. They can't digest bones. Um, so if they've gone outside and caught a bird, they might have some stuff in there that's not moving through. And they know that if I eat this plant, it'll make me throw up and maybe I can clean all that out and I'll feel a little better. Folic acid. Maybe your cat is eating your plants because they're craving folic acid, which is found in the juices of some grasses. And it's an essential vitamin for cats. And if it's deficient in their food, they may feel like they need to get some. It's also found in liver. So a, a liver additive or a folic acid a nutrient additive for your cat may just make them stop eating your plants. Also, uh, a laxative, similar to the regurgitation, you know, some of that grass that doesn't get thrown up actually acts like fiber really is what's happening. And it helps to move things through their intestinal system if they're feeling constipated and backed up. So mucus, I've got this hypothesis. This is totally my opinion here. This is not scientifically proven. I've never heard anybody else make this connection, but your cat's esophagus and stomach and intestines are all lined with a mucus that protects it from the acids that are used to break down food, right? We all get acid reflux, so we kind of know what that's like. And the mucus is generated when the cat is chewing prey, right? Now, cats don't really chew because their jaws don't move to the side. They only move up and down, which is why that myth about dry food makes tartar come off teeth. That's a myth because they're not really chewing it. They're just cracking it. And so if they're eating commercial food, 
and they're not getting as much gnawing. So in the wild, if they kill a bird or eat a mouse, they're really kind of gnawing it up and down to break it into smaller pieces. Unlike when you give them canned food and they're just eating it, they're not doing that gnawing, right? So maybe because that gnawing makes that mucus and maybe if they're not getting enough gnawing opportunity, then they're not getting enough mucus in their system and they instinctively know that or their stomach's hurting, you know, because of the acid and they think that regurgitation is going to help soothe the pain or they know that when I chew more, I get more mucus and my stomach hurts less, right? Maybe. I don't know. Like I said, that's my hypothesis. So how do we stop it? Okay, remember this, not that. So give them their own stuff they can eat, right? There's lots of cat grass you can give them. Um, I happen to buy wheat grass. Wheat grass is typically what that cat grass is. So you can buy wheat grass seeds in bulk and just plant them. Just get a little planter, put some dirt in it, put the wheat grass in, a little bit of dirt on top, water it. Next thing you know, it starts sprouting up and um, your cat will love it. And so put that next to the plant that they're eating and um, say, I want you to eat this, that plant I love. So of course, prevent access, right? You know, put the plants where the cat can't reach um is the easiest way or build a, a cage around it they're usually not pretty ways to prevent access but don't let them near the plants they're eating um provide alternatives right so um again this not that is an alternative chew on this gnaw on this I like to give Pico um, freeze-dried pheasant necks to gnaw on, and maybe that keeps him from chewing plants. Make it unacceptable and the target's less attractive again, right? So you can spray those leaves with a commercial pet repellent, um, or you can spray your plants with water and then sprinkle cayenne pepper on it. It's not gonna hurt your plant and the cat's not gonna like the flavor of that. You can put mothballs in the soil. Sometimes that deters them from eating plants. You can also set booby traps in front of. So this is kind of along the lines of pre preventing access, but um, you can do like those roadie cups, those red roadie cups, make a tower of those in front of the plant. So if your cat goes to get to the plant, the cups go everywhere and it scares the cat off, that kind of thing. Um, increase prey play, right? Just amp up that cat's activity to reduce boredom, hide food puzzles around the house, you know, anything that is gonna make that cat more mentally stimulated and less bored. Better nutrition. All right, we can all provide better nutrition for our cats. Um, feed them wet, not dry. That's a whole nother podcast. But if your cat is eating plants because it is lacking something in its diet, then providing a better diet will fix that. And hairball remedy. There's all kinds of commercial products for hairball remedy. They're usually a malt paste that cats like a lot. So if you have a long haired cat or a cat that gets a lot of hairballs, then go ahead and give them a hairball remedy on a regular basis. And that might fix their problems so that they are, they're not focused on your plants. Okay, chewing cords. Don't we love that one? This one's, this one is, is hard, right? So, Again, obsessive compulsive behaviors is a lot of the reasons why cats chew cords. And again, it might be a, a pain relieving, it might be pleasure inducing chemicals in the brain. We don't really know why. It could be a coping mechanism if the cat is in a particularly stressful environment. It could also be a dental issue. So 50 to 90% of cats 
Now, I get this, 50 to 90% of cats over the age of four are suffering from some sort of dental disease. And less than 50% of people take their cats to the vet. So without a regular vet visit, you don't know whether your cat's having dental issues. And if the cat's not being sedated for an exam, it might also be dicey whether the vet's actually able to get in there and really look well in there. So gnawing could be a dental issue, trying to relieve pain. Chewing cords has also been shown to be something that hyperthyroidism cats do, right? Because with hyperthyroidism, it increases that activity level and increases their urge to gnaw on things, okay? Could be teething if it's younger cats and kittens, boredom, right? They're bored, there's not much else to do. I'm gonna chew on this cord. And by the way, every time I chew on the cord, mom comes running over, so I like to do it. Curious, what is that? I'm gonna just bite on it. And stress relieving. So chewing for some reason relieves anxiety and makes the cat feel better emotionally. So what can we do about it? First thing you need to do, take your cat to the vet and let's make sure that you're not dealing with the hyperthyroid issue or a dental issue maybe going on. Get your cat gnawing toys. These particular toys are like, uh, they have their silver vine sticks and silver vine is a plant that's similar to catnip. Cats, especially big cats, tigers and lions really love silver vine and it is a vine. So they take the actual vine wood pieces and they wrap them in this. And, and so this is a gnawing thing. My cat likes uh, pheasant necks, freeze-dried pheasant necks, gnaws on that, so it, it doesn't have a cord issue. Coverings. So I've got a story to, uh, to tell you. Oh, before we go into coverings, also gnawing things, you can get actually those smallest kind of rawhide type of dog treats and soak them in warm water and put them in the microwave to soften them a little bit for your cat, that can work too. So cover your, your cords with aluminum foil. So I, I got a call, a referral from Dallas Animal Services. A lady had come in with her cat. She said she had to surrender her cat and she was just in sobbing tears that her doctor told her she had to surrender her cat because she's on oxygen. And at night, the cat was chewing through her oxygen cord and she wasn't getting enough oxygen. And the doctor said, you've got to get rid of this cat. So she takes her cat to Dallas Animal Services to surrender it. And uh, thankfully, there was someone in the intake desk that handed her my card and said, hey, call Molly and let's just see if she can fix that before we take your cat. So she takes the cat home and she calls me and I told her to amp up the prey play, change the cat's diet, change when she fed her cat. That was key to getting that nighttime energy down and for her to cover her um, oxygen cord with just a little strip of aluminum foil. You don't need as much as shown in this picture, but just a little strip, just cover it because cats really don't like the taste of foil on their teeth fixed it overnight. She called and she was just in tears. I'm so thankful that, that we had saved, as she said, you've saved my life and maybe buddies too. So that works. You can also use Vicks Vapor Rub on, on cords. Um, that is a smell and a flavor that cats don't like that works pretty well. And then again, like I showed you earlier, this motion detecting air can, put that in front of the area where the cords are. Of course, you can always put the cords in a cord keeper. That may help too, just block them. Reduce anxiety, um, feel away, um, you know, multi-cat feel away, diffuser plugins that might help to reduce anxiety, food puzzles hidden throughout the house, anything you can do to help bring your cat's anxiety down. 
and then redirect that pent up energy to something that's more appropriate, like prey play. So you, your cat will also give you some hints. Your cat will do things prior to eating the cords. Maybe it's just entering the room. You see the cat enter the room, get out that wand toy and say, let's have a wear you out with prey play so you're not affixed on my cords. Okay, trash rummaging. Why do they get in your trash? Well, I'm fostering some kittens right now and they were all in the trash this morning. And it's because there were treat wrappers in there. <laughs> so cats rummage through trash because it's fun, right? It's fun to get in there and pull the stuff out and chase it around the room. It could be habit. If you have a cat that was a community cat, prior to coming to live with you, and it was used to getting its food out of a garbage can, then that can be a real hard habit to actually break. Could be they're just hungry, right? I didn't get enough to eat. I'm hungry. I'm digging around in this trash can hoping to find some leftovers. Again, it could be that they're lacking nutrients in their diet. That has a, it's very key when cats don't have the nutrients that they need in their diet, all kinds of behavior issues can start happening. So how do we stop it? First of all, remove access to it. Get yourself a trash can that's like this, that has a, a step on it or put it in a in something that, you know, mine's open top, which is why the, the fosters were all in the trash because they could, right? They had access, not a problem with my cat. So it's, we don't have a trash can like this. You can also weight the bottom. So if you have a tall trash can, put a brick or a cinder block or something in the bottom of it so that when the cat climbs up there to get in it, it doesn't fall over and spill the trash everywhere. You could store your food trash in the freezer. Um, you probably need an extra freezer for that. I know I would. I don't have any room in my freezer for trash, but usually they're after the food. So if you put all your food in a Ziploc bag and just stuck it in the freezer until trash day and then put it all out that day, that definitely keeps them from having access to it. You can spray the trash bag. This bitter lemon spray by Bodhi Dog is actually pretty effective. It, it could also maybe work on the cords as well. I've heard the Vicks Vapo Rub works a little better on cords, but if you spray the trash bag with this, that may help them. Um, better nutrition, always better nutrition, right? That's, that is so key in, um, in stopping bad behaviors, all kinds of bad behaviors. And when I say better nutrition, I mean more complete whole nutrition like the cat needs, right? And of course, that's better nutrition. That should have come up already. And of course, increase your prey play because increasing prey play always burns off more energy for a cat, redirects that, that pent up energy and that boredom. So pica, pica is cats eating things that are not food. And I've had several behavior cases with cats with pica and they could be eating rubber bands, towels, plastic toys, clothes, a lot of them will eat clothes, pillows. I've seen all kinds of things and, it, and it's not fun. It can create intestinal blockages that are, you know, obviously very serious for the cat and very, very expensive to fix. So it's a, it's a serious issue. So why do they do it? The causes of pica are really unknown from a medical standpoint. We, we really don't know much about it and why some cats do it and other cats don't. Plastic seems to kind of be the most attractive thing to cats with pica. <clears throat> 
some of the theories about why they do it. Again, attention seeking, right? We've talked about that. A lacking a nutrient in the diet could be. It's one of the first things I always do when I have a behavior case that is revolving around pikas. We look at what are you feeding and when are you feeding and that kind of thing. How frequently, all of that. And sometimes that in itself will fix it. Um, frustration. The cats are frustrated about something. Could be that all those bird feeders and squirrel feeders you have outside that really do provide great enrichment, but without prey play indoors are causing your cat to be really just like a pressure cooker with energy. So they see all that outside and that's great. It gets them all excited about hunting, but then if they never get to deliver that kill bite to something, if we don't simulate that hunting experience for them, then that's gonna cause a lot of pent up energy. And I've mentioned prey play and I think just about every one of these, and you should be prey playing with your cat at least twice a day for about 10 minute sessions. And anxiety, if a cat's environment is particularly stressful and causing the cat to feel anxious, they may be eating plastic or other things just to try to soothe themselves and to soothe that anxiety. So how do we stop it? Well, of course, prevent access. If they're eating your kids' toys or your husband's socks, then pick them up off the floor and put them away somewhere where the cat can't have access to it. That's, that's the first thing. You want to make sure it's a low calorie, high fiber diet. So Weruva makes a product called Cats in the Kitchen. That is exactly that. It's low calorie. It's high fiber. It's a good diet. You're going to want to maybe feed more food. How do you know whether your cat's getting enough food? There is a KCAL conversion over here, this little formula that I'm showing. And if you'd like me to email that to you, just shoot me an email, Molly at catbehaviorsolutions.org or molly at cattalkradio.com, either way, and tell them you want the how much to feed your cat chart and I'll email it to you. Um, I tell people to feed, I feed my cat four times a day. And the reason is because in the wild, they eat 10 to 20 small meals a day. So their whole day consists of hunting, catching that prey, killing it, eating it, and then they groom, and then they take a nap, and then they get up and they do it all over again, over and over and over throughout the day. And so when they don't get that opportunity indoors, that can cause, again, a lot of stress. So if you feed your cat more frequently, that helps to keep the stress of the environment lower. None of us can feed 10 to 20 times a day. We'd probably schedules just don't allow that. So I try to feed about 30 minutes at least after I get up in the morning. Um, I feed again about 1230. And if you're not home, there are food timers for that. And if you'd like me to email you the link to the food timer that I like that has a nice cold pack, it's cheap, it's like 20 bucks, um, send me an email and I'm happy to send you that link. And then when you get home from work, you know, 5.30, 6 o'clock, and then again, right before you go to bed. And then I also put that food timer out for a 3 a.m. feeding so that he doesn't have to go that full eight hours without eating. So he's eating about every four to five hours around the clock. And that is a lot more natural to the species. The more natural we can make the environment to the species then the better behaved in our opinion the cat is going to be clicker training this is an excellent way to keep your cat engaged and focused on something other than eating things doesn't have to be clicker can be marker training it could be something you say and then you reward it. So basically you're having your cat do something 
a behavior, could be high five, could be a sit, could be spin, and then you're rewarding for it. We did a, a webinar on clicker training. And if you go to my YouTube channel, you can find it there. But that's an excellent way for mental stimulation. And ignore the behavior, right? So if a cat is trying to get your attention by eating plastic, because every time I eat plastic, she comes running over to tell me to stop, then ignore it, right? Not to the point that your cat eats an entire plastic bag and has an intestinal blockage, but you'll know whether it's attention seeking or not. You can generally tell. They'll be looking at you to see if you're paying attention. Pico does it all the time, not by eating things, but he'll get up somewhere and he'll be like, are you looking? I'm just going to knock this thing right off the table where you don't want me to be as long as you're looking. Um, a remote control noise deterrent. So whenever I get flowers, which is infrequent because there are a lot of flowers that are toxic to cats. So I just don't typically get flowers. And if I do, I make sure they're the ones that aren't toxic to cats. And I put them in one particular place on, a, on an island in my kitchen. And so when Pico was a baby, you know, I, I decided what battles am I gonna really choose to have with this cat? And I decided keeping him off that island was a good idea because that's where I put my flowers. That's where we prepare food. So I got this remote control uh, noise to turn. It is actually like an alarm that you put on the front door, but you put this little white device where you want the cat to stay off of. And then you have the remote control button. And as soon as the cat gets up there, you hit it like a panic button and it makes a super loud noise and the cat goes running. It doesn't take but a couple times, unless your cat's deaf, of course, uh, to work. And this little device is maybe $12 on Amazon. Now, again, it's one of those things that doesn't work when you're not there, but if you are there and the behavior's happening, especially if it's attention seeking, then you can stop it without having to yell at your cat or your cat to feel like that's coming from you. And again, if you want um, a link to this little device, just email me and I'll send it to you. It is on my resource section of the site, but, um, but it may be hard for you to find. So, and of course, set aside 10 to 20 minutes a day, twice a day to pray play with your cat. I cannot tell you how much that helps. If you tell me your cat doesn't pray play, then I'm gonna tell you you're either not doing it right or you don't have the right wand toy. Different cats like different prey. You might have to have the feathers with the, with the crinkle paper so it makes that noise. You might have to make it go behind something to get your cat interested in it. It might have to be the mouse. I mean, it, you just need to do your work and make prey play happen for your cat twice a day. And if you have a multi-cat household, don't pray play with them together. Because one cat usually butts into the session and the other cat goes, eh, he always gets it, I'm gonna wander off. And it's not natural for cats to hunt together or to share prey together. So put one cat up in a room and pray play with one and then go in the room and pray play with the other. It's not a group activity. Okay, so that wraps up that. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that we can, uh, we can start chatting here about this. Uh, let's see what we have. And if you wanna just unmute yourself and ask a question, jump in. No, free feeding is not a good alternative to four to five hour feedings. First of all, if you're free feeding, you're feeding dry food. And um, if you've ever heard anything I've ever said, it's don't feed your cat dry food. And there's, um, we am sure we have a webinar about that. In fact, we did, we did one for Dallas Pets Alive. So again, if you go on my YouTube channel, um, you can dive into why that is, but free feeding is not natural to your cat at all. Your cat's species is used to hunting and obtaining their food in intervals and uh, not being 
not being free fed. Put your email in the chat. I absolutely will. Let me do that for you here. You deal with a kittens that are learning how to not bite. Kittens not to bite? Kittens, yeah. I've got an eight month old that is biting like crazy. Yeah, Pico went through that. It was horrible. I could not wait for that adolescent stage to be over with. Oh my gosh, it was just awful. Um, patience is the big thing. Redirecting so that when he starts to bite you, you first of all, put him down, turn your back, walk away, go get a wand toy, and then come back and redirect to a toy and not your hand. And it is hard. I mean, it's, it's an awful, you know, you probably got a couple more months to go before, uh, before it's over. I, I don't envy you. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> it's challenging. Yes. Very, very, very challenging. Okay. Anybody else? Any questions? Is something specific you're dealing with? There's something in the chat about a dog. I'm a cat. How do I stop my cat from urinating on my dog's bed? We've had our dog 10 years and adopted our cat in September, took her to the vet, all good, tried to feel away playing. Yeah, dog is submissive as well. Um, I'd, I'd have to look at your litter boxes and things like that, but cats typically urinate outside the litter box because of a medical issue a dislike for the box, a territorial statement, or trauma, right? Maybe the cat's not feeling like it has enough resources in the home for both it and, and the dog. I mean, there, there's so much at play there. I'd have to know a lot more information. Cat will pee on the bath mat. What is it about those bath mats? Someone says, even if the litter box is clean, my cat will pee on the bath mat in front of the tub and on my boyfriend's clothes if he leaves them on the floor. Any tips? Yeah, get a boyfriend that picks their clothes up off the floor. Uh, I mean, come on, pick your clothes up off the floor. I, if I would tell my boyfriend that to begin with. Um, but also then that when cats use their scent, it's for bonding. Remember when I talked about how with scratching, they're using that scent to create a layered scent, a community scent that also happens with people. So cats will pee on your bed or on your clothes or things that smell most like you with the person that they want to bond with. So the cat's not feeling like the boyfriend is part of the community. So boyfriends should feed the cats. It's another good reason to feed multiple meals a day because it gives us lots of opportunity for bonding. Boyfriend should feed the cat. Cat comes to eat, boyfriend pets the cat so that the cat's fully aware food came from boyfriend. Boyfriend does the prey play. Boyfriend does treat toss, that kind of stuff. So boyfriend's got to kick it up a notch and earn that cat's respect in order to get the cat to quit peeing on his things, typically. Yeah, and, uh, and Janae put in the chat session, uh, there is a, a whole YouTube thing that we did for Dallas Pets Alive on decoding urine issues. Oh, and your cat's really scared of strangers. How do I help him to trust visitors more? I've also got a podcast called Stranger Danger, where uh, I talk all about how to get cats to like strangers. But it's very much what I just described. Um, but there's a long process. First, you've got to get your cat conditioned to not be fearful of the doorbell when the doorbell rings. And then secondly, when someone comes in, you've got to make sure that the cat understands that's not a scary experience. And then there are just some cats that have had such trauma in their early life, they're not going to get over that fear, that trauma paralyzes them in fear. 
And um, sometimes we don't know, you know, we just don't know what's happened to our cats before we got them, got them as an adult. We don't know what's happened to them as a, as a kitten, but I've got a great podcast on that. And if you go to my site, catbehaviorsolutions.org, and you click on the Cat Talk radio navigation button at the top, there's a drop down that says podcast categories. And um, you'll find the stranger in there, or or you can also just uh, there's a search bar on my website. Just put in stranger in that, and you'll be able to find it because it's a hour long podcast with lots of really good um, techniques in there. Okay, my cat keeps begging for food or taking food off the counter or my plate. How do I stop that? My cat's seven months old. Oh, lucky you. And eats meow mix free feed. Okay. So probably your cat is not getting the right nutrition that it needs. Um, I have lots of nutrition information on my site and in my podcasts. And um, because cats will come after your food if they're not getting the food that they need. Right. And if, and if you're I, mean, I, I guess he learned those behaviors just. He was outside in the wild. His mother, yeah. She was it's, a stray cat, and then she had the babies, and then just took off, you know. If you're feeding your cat uh, dry food, anyway, so especially I, now, I did befriend him, and I brought him in because I didn't want my dogs to kill him. And, but he had a cat that, or seen a cat that had. I want to feed more meats cooked at the moment any guidelines i have eight of, of them of different breeds and five to 12 years old always not salt or additives every other day at least um i used to do um raw food feeding for my cat and i um and I made my own raw food. I mean, I, I didn't grind my own whole carcasses. I, I bought a uh, rabbit from hair today, H A R E dash today.com. And then I made my own raw food. Um, because if you think about it, cats don't cook their food before they eat it in the wild, right? Raw is certainly more natural to them, but um, it's kind of dangerous for us to handle. Uh, salmonella can be an issue for, for us, especially if you're immune compromised. It's not much of an issue for your cat. Your cat, you know, when I get x-rays of my cat, I do still feed my cat a raw food diet. I just buy commercial raw food. I use primal and the bricks. I feed him rabbit exclusively. And if he has to go in for an x-ray, you can see the bones in the intestines, you know, the little chips of bones that go through there, but they need the nutrients from the whole carcass. So um, that's the absolute best thing you can do for your cat, but um, it's not necessary. You can feed your cat just a high quality canned food and that's certainly plenty for them. I have lots of information on why not to feed dry food. Not to mention is that it's, you know, it's just not something cats can digest very well and it's not giving them nutrition that they need. Um, so if you want to send me an email, I'm happy to send you links on podcasts and uh, webinars that I've done about nutrition. And Janae has put in the chat to uh, please do the survey. All right, do a post session survey. And tell them you thought it was wonderful, by the way, so we can keep doing this. No, <laughs> please share what you what you thought about this. Let me see if there's anything else over here in chat that we might. Um, yeah, Pika, we talked about biting kittens. Yeah. <laughs> keep getting more cats until the behaviors improve, right? <laughs> Stop digging in the soil. Okay, that's a good one. Like in the plants, the soil on top of the plants. Yeah, that is so attractive to cats because well, that's where they pee out in the wild. And they're like, that's a litter box. And so they're digging in there and maybe even peeing in there. Put rocks on the top of it. I like those smooth black river rocks just because they go with my decor. But put those in the top or you know crushed rock or whatever you like the look of cover that soil with rocks 
and you can still water through that and that uh, that keeps them from digging in there. If you're talking about soil outside in your garden, don't let your cat outside because that's a that's a natural, natural, natural behavior for them. Someone commented that that orange couch looked like their couch. <laughs> and there's Yoli. Hi, Yoli from Italy. Thanks for joining us. I know this is an odd time of the night, I believe, for you. So thanks for joining us. And Rachel. Ciao. There you are. Hi. Ciao, ciao, ciao. <laughs> <laughs> and Rachel in Santa Fe, or Christine's in Santa Fe. Yeah, Christine Dugan. Great to see you. I'm just across town or down the street from you. <laughs> All right, everybody. Anybody else have a specific question about destruction issues that we didn't talk about? Nope. All good. All right. Thank you so, so very much for joining us today. Be sure to take the um, seminar. And uh, if you have any other questions, email me and I'm happy to send you links and the resources of all the things that we talked about in the seminar today. And if you have any suggestions for topics for future seminars, please also send those to myself or to Janae at Dallas Pets Alive, um, because I'm assuming we try to do these once a quarter. And uh, we have another one scheduled for December, I believe. No, I think we have one in the fall. Anyway, um, share your contact information with us and we'll be sure to put you on the list so you'll know what's coming up next. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining today.